So let me briefly introduce the class. Uh, the idea of the class just came to mind because there are so many Supreme Court decisions which people routinely refer to, including myself, but at least speaking for myself, I never actually read them. And it was a curiosity for me how the judges or justices on the court, how they reason their decisions. How do they decide that it's legal to burn a flag? How do they decide that it's uh, legal? At one point, it's legal to have separate but equal. Another point to say separate but equal is illegal. Um, how do they decide uh, whether abortion should be legal or not? Uh, all these questions. I was curious whether there are real arguments being made or whether it's just politics that people disguise their personal preferences in the language of law. Uh, and so I decided why not plunge into it as a class and see, uh, go through the decisions I have so far prepared classes for four of the decisions and in the course of time I will be selecting more. Uh, and uh, I have a basic format of how we're going to proceed. I'm going to try to avoid getting bogged down in technical legal arguments and to focus instead on the kinds of what you might call moral reasoning that the court uses. So I'm certainly no expert in the technical side. I'm gradually learning it as I go along. Uh, but I think there's enough in these decisions that we can just focus on the moral uh, reasoning and not focus on the technical points. Uh, and um, so that's basically what we're going to be doing. And I have to say it's my first time doing this. So a lot of it is going to be experimental. And we'll see how successfully it works. And at some point I'll probably if it works even marginally, with marginal success, then at some point I'll probably try to turn it into a regular class. But as of now, it's at the experimental stage. So having said that, uh, is there a reason why you're sitting there and not in the circle? So uh, I think you're, okay, so I think what we should do is yeah, back move back, back a little, and because you have to be part of the circle, otherwise you'd be violating Brown versus Board of Ed because you would be separate, which can't be equal. What? Uh, we're waiting for them to come down. Okay. Yes, I know. Can you please speak louder? I honestly couldn't, you know, because it will just be artificial for around three minutes and then it's going to come down to its, so to speak, natural volume. I won't be able to sustain it. Um, one possibility is if you two hear me comfortably, then you two could sit there and they hear if that's okay. Actually, my hearing's not so okay. Perfect. Fair. I would that's fine. I could make room, which In other classes, we haven't had a problem with the hearing, so it might just be this venue that's uh, imperfect. So I wouldn't worry about that uh, in subsequent classes. Okay. 
So what we're going to do now, step two, is for each of you to briefly introduce yourselves uh, so we have some sense of who's in the class. And I should warn you that, number one, I don't own a cell phone, let alone a smartphone. And if the phone goes off during the class, I'm going to be taking out my phaser and I'm going to set it not on stun, but kill. <laughs> so with that warning, I kindly ask you to turn those contraptions off, or switch them off. OK. And um, all right. Remind me, James, around midway through, because other people will probably come in, because they're going to be trying to figure out their way. And we can give them ample warning about whether or not they want their 15 minutes of fame. OK? So let's start. Your name is? My name is Marinelli. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I'm I'm an ESL teacher, and I'm here because I want to be better informed. Um, my name is Ricardo. I'm from Puerto Rico as well. I'm a social studies uh, teacher in middle school in Brooklyn. Um, and Which we're here school? Uh, middle school, you said? Middle school. Uh -huh. Where? Uh, in Brooklyn and close to Coney Island. That's where I live. Really? IS-228? Okay. David where A. Booty? We're in Coney Island. Avenue S. Okay, I'm Avenue U. Okay, well, I live closer to Avenue U, so uh -huh. it's around the vicinity. Um, Do you and drive? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever I use here, I'll use in class as well, so hopefully. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, my name's Anne, and I'm a retired nurse. We can't hear a word, and I'm right near here. Go ahead. My name is Anne, and I'm a retired nurse, and uh, I'm here because Norman is such an excellent teacher. And besides, he likes my brownies. For those of you who didn't hear, she said she's here because I'm an excellent teacher and because I like her brownies. Those <laughs> I concur on both points, but with all due modesty, I'd put the second first. <laughs> I really find that appalling, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to be I'm going to be very blunt about that, <laughs> because it's raining out. It's inclement weather. I traveled a very long distance, and the main impetus, the main incentive, were the brownies. Well, my neighbor sent some homemade cake, chocolate cake for you. Is that Wholly <laughs> inferior merchandise. <laughs> 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 Okay, I'll, I'll consider it as a surrogate until next <laughs> week. <laughs> yes? My name is Miren. I am an Arab American. In other words, a terrorist even at age 83. And I used to teach at Fordham University. I'm retired now. And she's an occasional friend who just came back from Lebanon where she set off two car bombs. <laughs> Hi. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Marcia Decatus, uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm a pre-health student, uh, studying for my MCAT right now, but I've always been passionate in social justice. So I'm just uh, using this opportunity to get a bit more informed in the area. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jesse. Uh, I am from Brooklyn, just a few blocks away. I didn't hear that you are... I'm from Brooklyn, just a few blocks away. Oh. Uh, my mm -hmm. name is Jesse, and I've always liked the study of history, and that's why I'm here today. Um, that's it. Thanks. Here you go. Hi. My name is Marjorie, and I find the subject fascinating. Uh, back in the 70s, I got a chance to see judges at work during one of the big marches on Washington and was appalled at the, uh, uh, the, the work that they did, uh, the way they had power, and I'd love to learn more about it. Thank you. Hi, 
My name is Linda David, and um, let's see, I, I studied with Professor Finkelstein, yay, at Hunter College, and I, um, I, I, I'm very interested in in the um, in court cases, and especially in the landmark Supreme Court cases. So I'm grateful and thankful that you're teaching this. Thank you. Name is Ashley Turnbull. I'm from the Bronx, but um, work in Manhattan, and I just thought it was an interesting topic. So I'm here to just get as much information as possible. I'm Judy Zuckerman. I live in the neighborhood, but I love the library's activities. And when I saw this course, it reminded me of a college course, which would have been over 50 years ago. And I think I hope it would be a continuation of a wonderful course. Hi, uh, my name is Debbie Aquino. I am a nutmegger. I just moved here about three you months ago. A nutmegger. I'm from Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> so we call ourselves nutmeggers, but I'm from Connecticut. Yes, nutmeggers. Yes. Nutmeggers. Yes. yes. From Connecticut, from the beautiful state of Connecticut. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything <laughs> particularly beautiful about Connecticut. Everything's beautiful about here. A lot of rich <laughs> people there. <laughs> um, so yeah. I just moved here, and I want to get more involved with the community. And uh, I love anything that's related to the Constitution. So um, I'm um, hoping to to get more education about our judicial system. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Nunez. I was raised in Brooklyn, born in Manhattan, and I'm just here to learn about one of the more, some of the more important subjects in American history. Thank you. Uh, my name is James. Um, I live in Astoria now, but I was uh, four months ago, I was in Bushwick, three months ago I was in Washington Heights, and I've been all over the place. Uh, I grew up in Japan. I'm a still a dual citizen. And what? I'm still a dual citizen, so I'm both Japanese and American, uh -huh. two citizenships. Uh, and I'm um, here because I'm ignorant about this subject and uh, I like learning. Hi, my name is Celeste. I've lived in Queens for three years. I work in kids publishing and I was just interested to learn. Hi, my name is Carrington. Um, I work for a food magazine. I'm in an editorial capacity, and I know nothing about legal cases, so I look forward to learning. Hi, my name's Jeremy, and um, I'm an artist. And actually, you had asked me to do a cover for you, but your editor had said no. But anyway, um, <laughs> <it was laughs> that's what you told me. Um, so I, I um, have to say that I have um, a bit of contempt for the law and um, see it as a very um, class um, oriented subject and I thought that this would put an interesting that under Norman's um, tutelage we could put that into a, 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 um, a good it, it could put it into a um, solid um, way of uh, solid perspective I should say hi my name is Ellen and I've been a freelance writer and translator and I'm interested in human rights what language do you Norman. translate uh, Italian Italian mm -hmm. I live in uh, Sunset Park Brooklyn and I'm an admirer of Mr. Finkelstein you and Marin <laughs> 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 She's going to balance you out. Yes. <laughs> yes my name. Detractor admirer. Uh, my name is uh, Alan Streeter. I'm also from Sunset Park. Uh, and I, I was interested in coming, partly again as an admirer. I'd, I'd read things of yours on Holocaust and Middle East and was curious to see. In other How words, you're working this. for the ADO. <laughs> 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 My name is Janet. I'm retired. Um, I live nearby. I like to take classes. Uh, my undergraduate major was in science. I didn't have enough um, social science history. I like to know what to really have a better understanding of what these seemingly very important cases mean. Okay. Norman. Yeah. Uh, you said you, uh, you're here because you have contempt for the law. 
about a month ago, I witnessed a stabbing on the, the subway, an attempted stabbing. And uh, I went down to the DA's office, and uh, they said they released the person who, the assailant, they released her in her own cognizance without bail. And I said, why? And they said, well, she has no prior history in New York City. I said, any place else? Well, yes, in Baltimore. But, you know, that doesn't count. So someone who runs around the subway with a knife threatening people can be released in their own cognizance, thus our contempt for the law. The stories I could tell, but <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be for another day. Um, okay, rather than make a thousand prefatory comments, I think that I would prefer if um, we just plunge into it and start the experiment. The only thing I have to say by way, by way of prior warning is that I'm going to take cases which are, so to speak, controversial. And I am going to make a determined effort uh, to play the devil's advocate. And I hope everybody here will find the moral and mental uh, wherewithal, not just to be politically correct. If the case is decided a certain way, number one, it doesn't mean that it was decided correctly, and number two, it doesn't mean that there are arguments on the other side. So I want to examine everything very closely and uh, remember what we're doing here today and for the next roughly eight to ten weeks is an exercise in thinking. It doesn't mean that I agree with anything I'm saying. It doesn't mean that even you agree <coughs> with anything you're saying. It means we're trying to think, trying to reason through an argument, and we're trying to find errors, holes, gaps in the arguments that are made by the court. So I hope nobody here is going to be restrained or constrained by political correctness. And there's no question here about offending. The first week we're going to be doing today the issue of uh, segregation. The second week we're going to be doing the issue of abortion. The third week we're going to be doing the issue of sodomy. The fourth ish week we'll probably be doing, doing f the flag burning case. And everybody has a right to strong opinions, but what we're going to be doing in the class is not, ha is not registering strong opinions. We're going to try to think and see whether the judges are making a convincing argument or not. I've had a chance to read several of the decisions, and so far I find the reasoning of the court to be wholly unconvincing and wholly inadequate. And we'll begin right now and see. The format's going to be as follows. <coughs> Number one, I'm giving you a severely edited version of the decisions. I am removing all of the technical aspect of the cases. For example, a large part of these decisions deal with the question of whether the legislative branch of our government or the judicial branch of our government should be deciding these cases. Should it be the legislative branch, Congress? Or should it be the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, which decides whether abortion is legal? Should it be the legislative branch or the judicial branch, which decides whether it's legal to burn, whether it's permissible to burn a flag? I am not going to be discussing those issues. They're just very technical, how it evolved the division between what is the jurisdiction of the legislative branch? 
what is the jurisdiction of the judicial branch. Uh, that's uh, something if you're interested in, go to law school. Uh, I'm just interested in seeing the kind of, as I said, moral reasoning of the courts. Now, the way we're going to do it is the format I have elected on after thinking it through is we're first going to read in each decision what's called at the top the syllabus. And that's just a case summary. What is the issue that the court is trying to resolve? After we read the summary, we're going to go around and ask the class where do you stand on the particular issue the court is confronting? And we're going to hear out your arguments, why you think A or why you think anti-A on the particular issue at hand. Then we're going to read the majority opinion. If there is a minority opinion, which in general there will be, uh, Roe v. Wade, wait one second, no, 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 no. Um, Brown versus Board of Ed was unanimous, but in general we're going to find minority opinions and we're going to go through them. So, that having been said, um, we're going to begin now. And who has a um, mellifluous and... I teach and I lead groups for women. I'll read you teach what? I teach and I read and I, I lead groups for a living. I'm an addictions counselor. I'm used to talking. Oh, addictions counselor. This is okay. just what we needed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to let you hog the spotlight because there are up and coming thespians in this class and they have, but we'll certainly make ample use of your expertise. So let's start. This decision was in 1896, and it's famous in our constitutional history, Plessy versus Ferguson, because it reached the conclusion that segregation or separation was permissible, but only on the condition that the facilities are equal. So states can pass legislation which separates or segregates groups on the basis of race. However, I'm always a little wary of making too bold statements. However, the case that they were examining, the case that they were examining was one in which the state legislation said the separate facilities would be equal. So let's see how this, what the issue was. Your name is Jesse? Yes. Okay, go ahead. <coughs> I'll start with a syllabus. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Listen closely, read closely, and then let's see what you decide. Go ahead. Um. U.S. Supreme Court, Plessy versus Ferguson, 163 U.S. 337 from 1896. Case summary. The statute of Louisiana, Acts of 1890, C.111, requiring railway companies carrying passengers in their coaches in that state to provide equal but separate accommodations for the white and colored races by providing two or more passenger coaches for each passenger train or by dividing the passenger coaches by a partition so as to secure separate accommodations and providing that no person shall be permitted to occupy seats and coaches other than the ones assigned to them on account of the race they belong to are not in conflict with the provisions either of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery or the 14th Amendment guaranteeing all citizens equal protection under the law to the Constitution of the United States. This was a petition for writs of prohibition and don't, 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 don't give me a hint. Ser Teorari Review, uh, originally filed in the Supreme Court of the state by Plessy, the plaintiff in error, the party who appeals at a lower court ruling. The plaintiff in error is the party who appeals. This is going up our court system, so 
the party appeals. Plessy, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the party who appeals a lower court ruling against the Honorable John H. Ferguson, judge of the criminal district court for the parish of Orleans, and setting forth in substance the following facts. That petitioner was a citizen of the United States and a resident of the state of Louisiana of mixed descent in the proportion of seven-eighths Caucasian and one-eighth African blood that the mixture of colored blood was not discernible in him, and that he was entitled to every recognition, right, privilege, and immunity secured to the citizens of the United States of the white race by its constitution and laws, that on June 7, 1892, he engaged and paid for a first-class passage on the East Louisiana Railway from New Orleans to Covington in the same state, and thereupon entered a passenger train and took possession of a vacant seat in a coach where passengers of the white race were accommodated. Petitioner was required by the conductor under penalty of ejection from said train and imprisonment to vacate said coach and occupy another seat in a coach assigned by said company for persons not of the white race and for no other reason than that the petitioner was of the colored race. That upon petitioner's refusal to comply with such order, he was with the aid of a police officer forcibly ejected from said coach and hurried off to and imprisoned in the parish jail of New Orleans. That petitioner was subsequently, subsequently brought before the reorder, sorry, subsequently brought before the recorder of the city for a violation of the above act, which act the petitioner affirmed to be null and void because in conflict with the Constitution of the United States. Okay. Majority of, go ahead. Okay. So, who would like to, in his or her own words, simply summarize what is the essence of the case that the court is going to adjudicate? Who would like to summarize in his or her own words? Not very complicated. Yes, go ahead. If you're black, you got to go to the black section. The white section, stay in the white section. Okay, uh, for the sake of uh, everybody in the room who might not have followed, can you just make it a little, more, flesh it out a little more? There are, the case is about a person of... Uh, Anyone, whether they appear to be black or not. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I'm sorry, I don't know what fraction it was. Again. It was seven-eighths seven and one-eighth. If you're one-eighth, you have to get into the... Black, to, into the uh, black section. Correct. Uh, but there are a couple of twists which we have to take into account. <coughs> yes? Uh, we're going to have to figure out something with the mic because it's going to slow things down. What did we do in the past? Oh, we had a smaller room. That's where. Or we had two mics. Okay, we'll figure that out because otherwise it's going to significantly slow the pace. Go ahead. The issue was that uh, it appeared that it was going against the equal protection under the law. So um, that was his position when fighting, or at least appearing before the court. For someone who was born in America, having been a citizen, is guaranteed equal protection under the law. And under this separate but equal clause, he was subjected to second class citizenship. Okay. Uh, just a couple of points which I would want to emphasize so we can get clarity on what's the issue. Um, number one, everybody is affected by the law. So a white person can't be in a uh, black section of the, either it's two separate trains, excuse me, two separate train cars, or it could be one car which is divided up by a partition. A white person can't be in the black part of the train, a black person can't be in the white part of the train. And at least as the description is laid out, there is absolute equality of accommodations. When our absolute equality would mean, in this case, in terms of physical accommodations, material accommodations. There's no claim being argued here that because they're separate, they are unequal. Okay, so uh, let's begin. We're going to go around the room. 
uh, you'll remind me of your name and gradually I'll learn it, um, all your names. Um, is the statute, in your opinion, is the statute fair or not? I'd say it's not fair. Why not? Basically, it discriminates in the, the state of Louisiana. It doesn't really. Um, We're going to pass the microphone slowly, so just take it and we'll go. Now, you're going to have to be precise because we're not going to let anyone get away with loose thinking. What is wrong, in your opinion, with this statute, with the law? What makes it wrong? You said you. D you don't think it's reasonable, it's fair, it's just. Why? The accommodations are equal. Both sides are confined to their car or their side of the car. It's separate but equal. Now you use the word, it's discriminatory. What is discriminatory? Well, it seems like you should be allowed to sit where you want to, and if you want to sit next to a black person who might happen to be your spouse or your friend, you're not allowed to. Right, but a white person is not allowed to sit next to a black person. So it's equal. You're getting equal protection under the law. But it doesn't allow you to do what you want to do. Well, there are many things in life we're not allowed to do that we want to do. There are a lot of men who would like to use the women's bathroom, but they're not it's allowed the opposite, to. It's actually. <laughs> <laughs> the men never have a lot. <laughs> uh, oh, I understand what you're saying, but that's true, too. Uh, either way, you might want to, but so long as the facilities are equal, mm -hmm. women have to be in the women's bathroom and men have to be in the men's bathroom. Okay, we're going to move on, but we're going to uh, hear you out. What's wrong with that statute? If you think it's wrong, or you could say, you can argue, that actually, come to think of it, I think it's reasonable. Um, no, I, I, I too think it, it's unfair, and, and I think the fact that it's a that it's a public conveyance and really discriminating against equally against both white and black uh, passengers, uh, and you know besides, I mean, which isn't addressed in the in the in the case at all the the whole um, white and colored race fallacy that is being utilized in, in the argument. Um, we're going to move on because I can comment on each one. I'll gradually accumulate comments as we move. What makes it wrong or is it wrong? Well, it's statute? wrong and, and one of the things is I mean, accepting for the moment that there is such a thing as a white or black race, which I don't. Who is to say it gives too much power to the conductor, I mean, to decide? I mean, it's just wrong because it's ambiguous who, judging people by their appearance. But are you Let's say you're judging. I mean, you're uh, deciding where they're going to sit because you've decided that this person is black or this person is white. But how are their rights? In this case. They, they have a nice seat. <laughs> so what difference does it make? Well, as someone said, it's... It makes a difference that you're entitled to equal treatment. But you're getting equal treatment. No, you're not, because you're not getting to sit where you prefer all other things being equal. That doesn't make any sense to me. If a male wants to be on a female basketball team, 
you're allowed to say that the male can't be on it. And if a, a female wants to be in a male basketball team, you have the right to say that the female can't be on it. The only requirement is that they should have equal access to the same facility, namely in this case, a sporting team. Well, but no, there's no obligation that men should be allowed to be on a female team, and there's no obligation that women should be allowed to be on a male team. But a game is something that's a construct. It's not a construct, it's a real thing. It's, well, it's basketball, real. There, are st <laughs> there are basketball courts, there are hoops, you know, well, it's a real thing. It's and an so example of something that's real and a construct also. <laughs> Um, I'm still unconvinced. Go ahead. I think that we're all coming from the assumption that, that the people who would be told to move would be the black people. And I think if I were black, and not so long after slavery or today, that I'm sitting on a seat and a white person comes and sits next to me, I might be repulsed by that person. <laughs> just because they're white. And I would like, <coughs> therefore, to be able to say to the conductor, you, he has to move, he's the wrong color. I don't want this person next to me. Um, so I think, I think there's another way of seeing it, which is that way, from, because it doesn't say in, in, the, uh, in the law summary, it doesn't say that the people told to move are only the black people. That's correct. Um, I disagree with the court's assessment. Um, I think it's the an court didn't make an assessment yet. Right well, now, oh, oh, the law. Okay, the law. The court is now discussing the legality uh, of the law, the statute that was passed in Louisiana. Okay. Well, it seems to infringe on the person's civil or on all parties' civil liberties, and without any obvious service to the public good. What right is it infringing on? Um, freedom of locomotion. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to hold that. That was your point as well. The issue of freedom of locomotion. I'm going to ask you to hold it. I'm a little perplexed by that argument, though, because as I said, we have all sorts of laws in our society which infringe on what you call freedom of local locomotion. I can't locomote myself into a woman's bathroom. You, you can if you identify as a female. Excuse me? Men are allowed in women's bathroom if they identify as female. Or otherwise uh, women. I I've uh, been in locker rooms with men who identified as female. They're women. Uh, no, actually presenting as men. It, might. it was controversial. What's that? They could still be women. You Not, we were in the shower. It was you can't tell if someone's a woman by looking at them. Uh oh! I, that's another, that's I think another that's discussion. going to be another Supreme Court decision. I think it may be, but um, not presenting that he wasn't presenting. As okay, before anyway, we go there, because okay. Car <laughs> Carrington represents an unusual point of view. I suspect most people in this room would not think it's a constitutional infringement on their liberty to have male and female restrooms. So my question is, why is that freedom of locomotion infringed upon and nobody finds, or most people don't find it uh, particularly oppressive or offensive, but this other freedom of locomotion to be in the, the train car that you prefer uh, is considered oppressive. But we'll move on. What do you say? Oh, I did, just if I could add one thing, I did say it serves a it doesn't serve a public interest, whereas I think <coughs> some of the points you're talking about do serve a public interest. Okay. There are two points that Carrington make. I, the only reason I'm highlighting them is they're going to come up in the court decisions, both in the majority decision and in the dissenting decision. Uh, the first point is the court is going to make an argument about the public good that's served I don't, by separating out the races. I won't get to that just yet. 
And then the dissenting opinion is going to discuss what already has been discussed, namely that right of locomotion, that is, to be where you want to be. Go ahead. Um, my name's Celeste, and I think it's unfair. Um, and I think so because it rests on two assumptions that I think are wrong. First, that that there's the possibility of two of the seats being equal. And second, that like that you could find a way to tell what race somebody was, either by looking at them or by looking at their ID. And I don't think either of those um, are possible. OK. Uh, there are two points there, one of which the opinions never address, namely the question of how do you go about classifying races and how valid is the classification. The second point that you just made was the, what was it? That you could, it, it's assuming that you could have equal seats. Right. The second point is going to become more complicated because uh, it's never actually argued either in Plessy or in Brown that Une uh, separate is always unequal in terms of material conditions. Namely, they all accept that separate can be equal. And I think we all recognize that in theory, I'm not saying in practice, in theory, separate can be equal. You can have separate women's colleges, which are at every level, quality of teaching, facilities, they can be equal to any men's college. Nobody would ever say that Mount Holyoke or Wellesley or any of the other well-known women's colleges are in any way materially unequal to men's colleges, even though they're separate. They're what were called back then girls' schools, now women's schools. But nobody ever would claim or did claim or would uh, presently c claim that Smith College, Wellesley College, Mount Holyoke, all women's schools can't be equal. They are equal. They are equal in every, uh, by every material measurement. So the court is going to grant that separate can be equal in terms of physical facilities. Now, as everybody in the room knows, the main grievance during the civil rights movement was that separate was not equal. The schools were of inferior quality all the public accommodations were inferior. But the court never addresses that because it accepts the principle, as we'll see, that separate can be equal. And in fact, it can be equal, I think. There's nothing inherently unequal about separate, although the Brown decision will say the reverse. But they're not going to say for material reasons. They're going to say for psychological reasons. That once you separate, then a feeling of inferiority sets in among one of the two groups of people. But materially, <clears throat> they can be equal. OK, go ahead. What do you say? Um, my name is James, and um, uh, uh, both of you already touched upon it just now, but um, uh, the first point you made, but uh, like where would I sit? <laughs> I don't know, like if I time traveled back then, where would I sit? I, where would I go? I, I don't know, like that, I, maybe that's discriminatory. Like That's a point. Yeah. Uh, the court only raises the issue of two alleged races. Yeah and it doesn't speak to the possibility of 
falling between the cracks. Maybe you would get to be in either car. <laughs> I don't know. On my own car. That'd be cool. <laughs> Hi, my name is Eric, and my question is, wasn't it our founding fathers who said that every man was created equal? I'm probably wrong about that. Um, and of course, I agree with the. Uh, I agree with everyone who says that this is this is this decision was right. Um, wait, wait. Which decision was right? Uh, the decision made by the U.S. Supreme Court, in which they ruled that it was unfair. No, this particular decision, they're going to rule that it is fair. Oh, yeah, f fair. My bad. Um, no, they're going to say that it w separate but equal is fair. Okay. This was the old decision in 1896. In 1954, they effectively reversed Plessy. So give me your reasoning. Why is it unfair? Um. It's just on an emotional level, it probably won't, it probably won't, uh, it, this probably won't be a good uh, idea in, in court, but just on an emotional level, it just feels wrong that blacks and whites have to be separated from each other in, in, in the train. It's just wrong to me. But that's not a legal argument. I know, I know, that's what I was trying to say. You're not going to get on the court with an argument like that. Yeah, that's why I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hmm. All right, we'll move on. You have plenty of time to work out your argument. Um, hi, I'm Deborah. Um, if I was to see this case in 1896, as the person that I am right now, I would agree with the court because um, by just looking at it by theory, it seems perfectly okay, right? We still have an equal card and I'm still, I still have, um, I'm getting uh, a seat that I pay for. It. So I don't, it, it doesn't seem like um, it will be a problem, especially if I'm gonna be sitting with people of my kind. It didn't, for me, I think in 1896, it will be okay. But looking at it from this perspective, from today's world, when we have seen government interfering and um, putting people um, in um, camps and segregated <laughs> places, um, psychologically, um, it, it doesn't make sense. It's, it puts another person in a position where uh, it's you versus them. And um, I would agree with the, with the um, Ferguson case that it is a psychological um, thing going on. But in 18 1896, in mm -hmm. go ahead. In 1896, I would um, completely agree. I think looking at it at that point, uh, with that point of view, yes, I would agree with it. Okay. Uh, my name is Judy. I have some issues with some of the facts. Um, first of all, a man bought a ticket. I uh, paid money. The ticket broker, I assume he did it in person, but he may not have done it in person. But if he did do it in person, did his ticket say that he was black? Who has the right to identify a person whose skin is white? He's, no one else has ever, it appears that no one else has um, called him anything but white. He's obviously had been a white person, quote unquote. And suddenly, this conductor comes along and is depriving him of what he feels is his right uh, to sit in the coach that he purchased the ticket for. But he got the coach for which he purchased the ticket in terms of quality. If he purchased a first-class ticket, he would get a seat in the first-class coach. He's not being deprived of anything. So where is the injustice? Well, I somehow feel he's, um, 
he's being told that he's he's less of a person. But if he's he getting the same, if he's getting the same accommodation, why do you infer that he's being told he's a lesser person? I don't see the leap there. Because he appears to be white. So what? It's you that's attaching value to being white. You think it's being superior to being white. If you just assume they're two different colors, then there's no higher value to being white. Is there? You, you seem to be saying, if he doesn't get acknowledged as being white, then he's somehow suffering. But then, let's say he's 100% black. Does that mean he's somehow inferior? I think yours is the racist argument. <laughs> Am I wrong? Somehow I feel that his um, I think it, it, is he getting equal protection under the law? Yes, he's getting the full getting accommodation, accommodation for which he was paid. paid. Yes. Okay, we're going to be coming back to it. Uh, Ashley Turnbull. Mm -hmm. I would say this, if I paid the same amount of money everybody else paid, and you're saying the accommodations are supposedly equal, mm -hmm. but why is there a need to separate if we're all paying the same dollar? Yeah. Oh, because okay. we're getting the same level of service. Okay, and we're going, yeah. with, that's <laughs> the argument that Carrington made, she said, if, we're all, if we all pay the same amount and we're all getting the same service, then why is there a need to separate? And Carrington said, I want to see some, what is the public good that comes from separating? And we're going to see that. The court, of course, has to address that issue and the court will address it. But let me ask you uh, a, a, a simple question. If I were told that I'm getting the same accommodation, okay, same leg room because I just got off flying, so I'm very concerned about leg room. Um, same leg room, my chair is going to recri recline to the same angle. I'm very concerned about that because Spirit Airlines is now charging for the ability to recline. <laughs> it is. Yes. The seat is exactly perpendicular. That's the uh, first level. And then you pay per inch. So if you want one inch recline, you have to pay 20 extra dollars. Two inches recline, 50 extra dollars. Do you the have to pay extra if you want to sit behind a seat that doesn't incline? <laughs> That's a very important <laughs> issue. But um, the one, the actual seat, you feel like you're being strapped into an electric chair <laughs> because of the angle. But okay, that's a separate story. So as long as I, my attitude would be, and you'll, uh, and actually you'll tell me where I'm wrong. My attitude would be, hey, if these, let's say I'm speaking as a person of Jewish descent, and the pejorative, the negative term for a non-Jew is a goy, okay? So I'd say, if these goys don't want to sit next to me, F them, I don't care. Just as long as I got my seat, you don't want to sit next to me, go to hell. So I wouldn't care. I wouldn't give a darn about the statute. I wouldn't see it as discriminating against me. Just so long as you make sure I'll be very, you know, careful, check the other seats in the, on the other side of the partition, 
If they get a free bottle of water, I want a free bottle of water. If they get free chips, I want free chips. But so long as it's equal, I'd say, you know, go to hell. <laughs> I'm very happy in my seat. I don't care. Why wouldn't that be your attitude? Well, I would say that without getting emotional here, mm -hmm. that never happens. Nothing is truly equal when you separate. That's the reality of it. And we all experience different things and so forth as we move forward. What's right, wrong, or so forth. But to have someone arbitrarily say that just because of separation, we're separating you because of this, whatever that is, makes one race, one person, one group superior to another. I don't so see that. Well, I don't. No, you, I, I don't you may find. Not see it, but that's how it is. <laughs> 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 Actually. I don't feel inferior or superior to women, even though they're separated out in separate bathrooms or in separate athletic teams. But I, I would say that the argument for me with that is that we are born what we are, whatever gender we are, whatever color our skin is, and so forth. So to someone to predetermine and say, you should do this, or you should be separated because of something that we had no choice in how we were born and so forth. That's, I think that's the discrimination part. Um, okay, we're gonna be looking at it, go ahead. I, I, I agree with, with Ashley in that, um, I think that um, just because the accommodations are materially equal, mm -hmm. um, Th then why this then why the separation a and and that the that the separation um in, in, some, in some people's minds mentally um, Linda, some people prefer to be separate well, women attend women's colleges because they prefer not to be with men in college but, but that's their choice but they're no choosing choice separation. There's nothing inherently discriminatory or stigmatizing about segregation. There are many people who choose it. They choose to go to all women's schools. It's their choice. But there's still the fact that they're in separate does not make it discriminatory or stigmatizing. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, partly, I think Ashley brought up a, a piece of it, which is just why. Uh, say, say We're going to get to the why. Green and blue, you know. We're going to get to the why. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> believe me. And you, you said also the... I, the I, okay, I'm not going to say it now. I'll get to it. Go ahead. You, know, that you said also that a different case, deal, or uh, excuse me, the Brown case much later in time, deals with the, psycho uh, the psychology of uh, separate but equal right. that they can't mm -hmm. do. But if you want to, so if you're avoiding that for now, for this case, then just the simple question is why. If it's separating green and blue or triangles and squares. I, I'm why? really so surprised people in New York are making this argument since probably 90% of you in this room live in ethnic neighborhoods. We're always separating out. And all of a sudden you're asking why. You live in a black neighborhood, a Hispanic neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood, an Italian neighborhood, an Irish neighborhood. And all of a sudden everybody is bewildered by the idea of why would you want to separate out? But that's what everybody does. There's an Indian neighborhood, there's a Pakistani neighborhood, there's a Chinese neighborhood, there's a Korean neighborhood. Why is it such a perplexity w that people would want to separate out? Uh, wait, we're going to go. We're going to get to you in a moment. Go ahead. Uh, for one thing, they made the choice. The choice was not put on them. They were not told they had to sit separately from other people. They chose to do it on their own. Yeah, but the question has been put, why would you want to separate out races? And the answer I posed was, we're always separating out. 
That's why New York is all ethnic neighborhoods. That's not true. No, it's New not York true. is not all ethnic there neighborhoods. There isn't a Greek neighborhood, an Italian neighborhood, an Irish neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood. Uh, most Jewish neighborhoods are not separate. Uh, Plenty of other people have are you in ever the been, neighborhood. Have you ever been to Borough Park? <laughs> and most do you Jewish know how neighborhoods many people are not in Borough separate? Park are also not Jewish. Excuse me? I live in Forest Hills, which is supposedly a Jewish neighborhood. Do you know how many Asian and how many black and how many Italian and how many everything else live in the exact same neighborhood? And you know how soon Jews won't be living in that neighborhood? Let's move on. <laughs> what did you say? Um, okay, I, I think that it's based on a number of fallacies. And, but to start with, uh, the fact is that it does say in here that there are coaches that are occupied by the white race mm -hmm. and by all non-white races. It doesn't say all, mm -hmm. but it says non-white races. Mm -hmm. Persons not of the white race. Um, and for no other for no other reason, reason that this particular petitioner was of the colored race on the first page. Mm -hmm. um, I think the basic fallacy, uh, well, I, I won't bring up the reason why, because you said we'll get to that later, mm -hmm. but um, there is a basic fallacy in the idea, first of all, that the white race should be separated out from all others, and second of all, that there is such a thing, aside from theory, that there is such a thing in reality as separate but equal. Because it wasn't, and it never was. That's a, a distinct issue. And unfortunately, the courts don't address it because the statute itself promises that it will be equal. So it's a separate question. Jesse? <coughs> Um, I've got a few notes, so just let me get to the end of them, of all of them. Um, there's the idea of fair versus not fair. Um, I would say it's not morally fair, and I think the black person being ejected and arrested would feel and know that. Um, it's the problematic. The white person would be ejected also. Hang on, let me finish. Um, problematic because it puts unfair, unjust burden on the conductor who is unqualified to decide. Um, it's problematic also because would a white person actually be ejected if he sat in the black section? Um, let's say he was. For argument's sake, let's assume the statute was being enforced. I don't know. I mean, it does. there is no white person being arrested here, so we don't know. Right, because white people would prefer to be in their own car. But let's say there was overflow. If a white person decided to stay, hey, look, you know, tough, I'm going to stand in your section. I mean, and by the way, give up your, your seat. Would the white issue. person be arrested? Somehow I doubt Separate it. Separate issue. Okay. Anyway, just a thought. Mm -hmm. Coming from the legal standpoint, if the cars are equal, mm -hmm. then the law is just according to the strict letter of the law of the day. But at the same time, it is an expression of discrimination everywhere. Why? Because there was discrimination everywhere. There was, uh, That's not see, an answer. Were, Why is the law discriminatory? It's an exp I can't. I know. I can't express it any better than that. It was an expression. It's one more example of discrimination that was happening positively everywhere. Um, and then, as far as um, you know, maybe this is a separate issue. I feel it's a separate issue. I'm not sure. I would argue this case uh, using present day cases um, or even ideas that didn't exist yet back then. It seems like a false equivalency, like bringing in the idea of bathrooms, separate bathrooms. I mean, back then, there was absolutely no argument. Women were going to be in this bathroom, and men were going to be in the bathroom, and the idea of transgenderism wasn't even on the horizon. So I think it's there a little bit of a... transgender. I'm sorry to... I'm not sure that, but having there back then... Wait, that. wait, thank you. Just that the back then, it wasn't... The idea of it wasn't even around. No, I'm just mind. trying to illustrate the point... I wouldn't use a, a case now mm -hmm. to argue a case back then. I think it's a false equivalency. That's all I'm saying. Okay, let's move on. Hi, Marcia. Um, I think 
for me it just really comes down to choice um if we take it outside of this um uh, these separate uh um, courts or separate um carts take it as simplistically as going to the mall and wanting to buy a specific green shirt if i want a green shirt because my money is paying for that green shirt i should be able to pick up the green shirt of my liking bring that to the register and pay for it and i feel that in this case his choice is being denied he's not able to make his choice because he wants to sit in this chair but for whatever reason he's saying no you have to sit over there and i think when you pay for the opportunity to sit in the chair of your choice that should be honored and that's not what's being honored i want to ask you a question marcia yes you walk into a theater mm -hmm. right and there are the, there's the seating arrangement right okay that seat gives you exactly the same view of the stage mm -hmm. as that seat right exactly the same view of the stage okay you say you want to sit in that seat it's vacant correct yes okay and the um the usher says no that seat has been reserved for friends of the actor okay mm -hmm. but the usher says you can sit in that seat exactly the same view of the stage would you find that objectionable i i wouldn't under that case because i feel um how do i say think about it because we'll be coming back moran okay. i don't accept the idea of separate can be equal when separate is based on the color of your skin. It is something that you see. And then if what you see goes to your brain, then you know that we are all born equal. And yet you have separate spaces for white and black people. What did the black or white guy do? There is nothing that he has done. It is something that he inherited. So what are we judging? Yeah, but Marin, that argument would only be relevant if somebody in some way or some manner suffered some loss or penalty by virtue of his or her race. No. But I see no loss or penalty so long as the facility is equal. <coughs> no, no, the facility is equal does not mean that we are equal. If you put us in two different wagons, mm -hmm. then we are not, we don't belong in the same space. Why? Because of the color of our skin. Correct. So this is already harmful to the person who feels, and don't forget, I mean, this is falls back on slavery. We're going to, okay, I'm, I'm going to speed up a little because I want to get to the court's reasoning. Yes, one more point when mm -hmm. you said a neighborhood ethnic. We choose to live with mm -hmm. people. We are not obliged and told. So right, you choose to live among Jews or Italians or whatever. Right, and, and one of the reasons we choose to live in ethnic neighborhoods is because it creates a more harmonious community among the different neighborhoods. Because it's easier. Uh, what? It's because easier it and easier. people prefer Dare I say it? Is it so politically incorrect that we can't say it? People prefer to be among their own? Isn't that why we have ethnic neighborhoods? All of a sudden, people are denying the most basic fact of life in New York. Greeks prefer to be among Greeks. Italians prefer to be among Italians. Irish prefer to be preferred to be among Irish. Jews prefer to be among Jews. That's a basic fact of our life. You keep talking about it as if nobody would ever choose that, but we choose it all the time. No, right, right. No, no, no. Go ahead. No. We're, we're going to. The last thing you're not going to like, Jews is not a nationality. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Our, uh, James, I hope you capture that for YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, Moran will be deported. Some, something, I, something I've been advocating for decades now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a throwing away party for you. Yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Anne, and uh, I, I feel that a number of people have said this already. I know that you said it when you spoke first. I think you said it, Jeremy, and Marge had said it. It's a matter of choice. This man is paying his money, the same money that other people did, to sit in a certain seat in a certain car and to be told, no, you can't sit here, you have to go sit there. I think it's a matter of choice that is being, um, uh, it's not being honored. Okay, so you still haven't addressed the question of two seats with the exact same angle of the stage, but we'll get to that. Go ahead. So law is an abstract, as we were seeing it, right? It's a fair uh, on paper, correct? So unfortunately, it is fair, I think, in my opinion if both sides are exactly equal. Now, the very difficult part of law is that it doesn't really correspond with reality all of the time. But in terms of just equal treatment and fairness as a concept, fortunately under the law, it could be plausible. Um, if I were gonna tackle the case, I would focus on the race issue. How would you create a system that classifies each passenger as what, and how the psychological impact of that will multiply once it's taken uh, out of the trains. Um, I want to join the others in asking why the need for segregation. Okay, we're going to get to that. Okay, no, that's been since Carrington uh, uh, interjected. Um, there have been several major uh, disagreements with the law, freedom of movement, freedom of choice, or how do you classify races, and what is the benefit such that why not just give everyone the seat they want? Why should what is the benefit from this law? So let's look. Let's turn over the page, and we're going to start reading the court's decision. Uh, we're going to, uh, because separate is equal, we have to give a woman <laughs> the opportunity to speak. And um, I know there are all divisions now, and so we have so many categories of people to make it separate but equal. I'm not sure where to begin and where to end, but we'll start with Marsha. Then we'll move to blondes. <laughs> then we'll move to senior citizens. <laughs> What's this males of Heather say? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Majority opinion. Mr. Justice Brown, uh, the second page. Mm -hmm. Mr. Justice Brown, after stating the case, delivered the opinion of the court. The constitutionality of this act is attacked upon the ground that it conflicts both with the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Unfortunately, if I had a projector here now, we would look at that 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, but for our purposes, we'll just say briefly, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. Abolishing slavery. <clears throat> and the 14th Amendment, which prohibits certain restrictive legislation on the part of the states that it does not conflict with the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, is too clear, is too clear for argument. Okay, so the court says, trying to invoke the 13th Amendment in order to knock down the statute, the court says that's ridiculous. This statute has nothing to do with slavery, so it says, let's move on. And let's look at the 14th Amendment, which promises equal protection under the law. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. By the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are made citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. And the states are forbidden from making or enforcing any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States or shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property <coughs> 
without due process of law or deny to any person within their jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Okay, so the 14th Amendment right here in this passage, the court is summarizing the 14th Amendment. And for our purposes, the importance of the 14th Amendment is that nobody's life, liberty, or property should be deprived without the due process of law, without uh, having your day in court, so to speak, and that everybody is guaranteed equal protection of the laws. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, the object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color, or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. Okay, that's actually an important passage. So we're going to have to repeat it. The object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law. In a court of law, there's going to be no discrimination between the races. But, says the court, in the nature of things, the 14th Amendment could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. So what the court is here saying is the 14th Amendment guarantees equality before the law. For example, the right to vote, or for example, the right to a jury of one's peers. But it says the court never intended, or the law, the 14th Amendment, never intended that it should abolish the separation of the races. It never intended that there should be a commingling, a uh, physical uh, proximity of the races. And so it goes on to say, continue, Marsha. Mm -hmm. Laws permitting and even requiring their separation in places where they are liable to be brought into contact do not necessarily imply the inferiority of either race to the other and have been generally, if not universally, recognized as within the competency of the state legislatures in the exercise of their police power. Okay, who can say what is they saying there? Because it's going to be an important point, one which we discussed already. Yes, your name? Yeah, I'm Marjorie. Mm -hmm. um, it was my question before. Do states' rights come into it at this date? Well, they're saying that a state has the right to pass such a law because their first argument is going to be if you separate races, what's the argument? Come on, who can summarize it? It's right there before you in black and white. If you separate races, it doesn't necessarily imply Inferiority. 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 The fact that you're separating races, there's nothing intrinsic, there's nothing inherent, there's nothing necessary in the fact of separating races that implies inferiority or superiority. But that ignores that, that, historical that, fact, you know, slavery. Okay. Uh, what? Your name? Janet. Janet says it ignores the historical fact of slavery. That argument is going to come up in the dissent by Judge Harlan that it ignores the historical fact. I'm not really convinced by that argument because I don't see how the historical fact of slavery changes the fact that separation is not necessarily a badge of inferiority. Uh, I don't know, there are, most people in this room are considerably younger than myself, but I went through, in the 1960s, I went through two periods 
There was one period which was called integration, and that suggested that separation meant inferiority. But then I went through a period of black power where African Americans said they wanted to be separate. And there was nothing necessarily inferior about the decision or the choice to be separate. That didn't mean inferiority. And so the court's first argument here is that uh, laws permitting and even requiring their separation in places where they are liable to be brought into contact, here referring to a train car, do not necessarily imply the inferiority of either race to the other. Ashby? Ashley? Right. Um, I mean, just the, 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 the virtue of separation, back to that why question, and when I look at even all of these, let's look at who's actually reviewing or writing the laws. It's individuals who want to keep what they have. So they're going to put these laws and these recommendations and so forth to justify why things are the way they are. Um, I, would, I would say something with the Black Panther, just like any organization that stands up, um, Italian or whatever, is because they, they, they became a reality because they didn't feel they were getting a fair shot. Mm -hmm. So if you're not feeling like getting a fair shot, then you as a group, whatever your group is, come together and say, hey, we can get more buying power, we can get more things because we need to be together to move forward. So if we all were getting so-called fair shots, there wouldn't be a real need for a lot of these organizations to come about. That would be my argument. Yeah. Okay, but I, I, I'm hearing you out and I'm listening to every word. Okay. I want to still persist in the question posed by the court. The court says that separation does not necessarily imply inferiority. Is that true or not? No. no. If you separate what? people out, by force, mm -hmm. by law, there's yes. There's a major difference. But if people separate themselves out because they want to be separate, that's a totally different story. Separating people out because they have to be separate makes them different and that they don't belong and that they are less than the others. Because if they I don't weren't see where less, the, then they mm. wouldn't be separate. They'd no, be able to sit where I, they please. Uh, okay, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to it, I promise. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that at all. People separate out for the simple reason that they're different. But that's... I, I lived in Washington Heights for that. eight years, and I realized I didn't belong there. I did not like salsa and merengue 24-7, 365. I could not live in a place where they blasted the stereos in the windows loud enough that their lawnsmen in Dominican the DR could hear them. So I separated choice. out and I moved into a nice, quiet Jewish neighborhood. Now, I never thought that, that implied inferiority. I just couldn't choice. stand it. If you like da 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 then you probably have some Dominican blood. I do not, and I did not like. Jesse. Separating oneself is is one story. Forcing to be separate is another. And it does imply inferiority because examples of it were everywhere. People talked openly about the inferiority of those who were being forced to be separate. It was just in the air. It wasn't hidden at all. So I guess it's hypocritical that the courts taking a stand that you know, of uh, being concerned with separate. I mean, who's making the laws? Who's okay, on the, who's I'm on the Supreme Court. I'm. I'm. Uh, I don't want to anticipate too much. Too much. That's what uh, 
you already raised the issue of the historical background, and now you're saying the court's being hypocritical. Uh, that's all going to come up in Judge Harlan's dissent, so we'll wait for it. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that it says here. Your name? Oh, Ellen. I'm sorry. Ellen. <laughs> Uh, they are saying that the law could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based on yes these are natural distinctions mm -hmm. uh, social distinctions but mm -hmm. in fact it was this law about the train was making distinctions yes and they said that's perfectly legitimate because well we'll get to why but they were living in a society mm -hmm. which was very hierarchical society and had been for thousands of years in which everything was depending on distinctions mm -hmm. and there were certainly people at the bottom and everyone knew it who they were from the way okay, they dressed, the way they rather talked, than the way rather than pursue it I rather let's we're going to get to the court's argument and then we'll respond to it the last line reads they're trying to demonstrate that separation is all over the place and nobody ever questioned it and the example they give is the most common instance of this is connected with the establishment of separate schools for white and colored children which at the time had not seen had, was not considered <coughs> questionable so they're using this as an obvious example where separate but equal was accepted by everybody but now let's go on uh, let's have oh wait we, we were now going uh, we have to have a Puerto Rican. Go ahead. <laughs> you read. <laughs> the distinction between... The distinction between laws interfering with the political equality of the Negro and those requiring the separation of the two races in schools, theaters, and railway carriages has been frequently drawn by this court. Thus, in Strada versus West Virginia, 100 U.S. 303, it was held that a law of West Virginia limiting to white male persons 21 years of age and citizens of the state the right to sit upon juries was a discrimination which implied a legal inferior inferiority in civil society, which lessened the security of the right of the colored race and was a step toward reducing them to a condition of servility. Okay. So they're trying to make out here the distinction between what, you, what they call political equality and social equality. And the court is saying, of course, our Constitution has to guarantee political equality. And the example of political equality that they give here is what? Jury duty. Jury duty. Jury duty. That they say if a black person is excluded from sitting on a jury, then his or her political place in society will be thrown into jeopardy. So the court says, of course, when it comes to political equality, there has to be full equality for all groups of people. Go ahead. Indeed, the right of a colored man that, in the selection of jurors, to pass upon his life, liberty, and property, there shall be no exclusion of his race and no discrimination against them because of color has been asserted in a number of cases. Yes, so the court is saying when it comes to political equality, such as serving as a jury, we the court have many times said that there has to be uh, full equality. Go ahead. Uh, let's have... Um, yeah. In this connection, it is also suggested by the Learner Council for the plaintiff in error that the plaintiff same in error is Plessy, the person who's registering the complaint in court. Mm -hmm. Council for the plaintiff in error that the same argument that will justify the state legisl legislature in requiring requiring railways to provide separate accommodations for the two races will also authorize them to require separate cars to be provided for people whose hair is of a certain color or, whose, or who are aliens or who belong to the certain nationalities or to enact laws requiring colored people to walk upon one side of the street and white people upon the other 
or requiring white men's houses to be painted white and color men black or their vehicles or businesses signs to be of different colors upon the separate but equal theory that one side of the street is as good as the other or that a house or a vehicle of one color is as good as one of another color. Okay, an interesting argument. Can anybody restate it? What is Plessy claiming? Uh, I would like to hear from someone else or we don't have a volunteer, then we'll go to you, Jesse. It just seems like he's saying, hey, where is this gonna stop? Yes, basically <laughs> what Plessy is saying if you can Where separate people <laughs> on streetcars, if you can separate people in streetcars, then does the law then allow that you can say white people have to walk on one side of the street and African American people have to walk on the other side of the street on the principle that both sides of the street are materially equal? Or if we're going to separate people on the basis of race in streetcars, why don't we separate them on the basis of hair color in streetcars? So Plessy's argument is that if you use this standard, it can be arbitrarily uh, and capriciously used to make all sorts of laws which on their face would seem to be, would appear to be absurd. Everybody get the argument? Okay, let me just read it one more time. In this connection, it is also to suggested by the learned counsel for the plaintiff that the same argument that will justify the state legislature in requiring railways to provide separate accommodations for the two races, that same argument will authorize uh, states to require separate cars to be provided for people whose hair is of a certain color, who are aliens or who belong to certain nationalities, or to enact laws requiring colored people to walk upon one side of the street, white people on the other side of the street, or requiring white men's houses to be painted white and colored men's black, or their vehicles or business signs to be of different colors upon the separate but equal theory that one side of the street is as good as the other or that a house or vehicle of one color is as good as one of the other. Now, that seems like a compelling argument. Let's see how the, the court answers that argument. Go ahead. The reply to all this is that every exercise of the police power to preserve the public peace and good order must be reasonable and extend only to such laws as are enacted in good faith for the promotion for the public good and not for the annoyance or the oppression of a particular class. Okay, what is the court's, they're going to explain that point, but what is the point, what is the court's response? Yes? <laughs> Thank you. That the court and the uh, legislature um, will not apply this ridiculously and that it is for the public good that this be applied to the races in separate but Excellent. Yes, the courts are applying that before you make a statute of this kind, before you enact a statute of this kind, you have to demonstrate, as Carrington already suggested, you have to demonstrate that some public good will come of this statute. And the court is saying there's no possible public good that can come from separating people on the basis of hair color, and there's no possible public good that can come from forcing people of white, uh, white people to f walk on one side of the street and black people to walk on the other side of the street. But that still begs the question, so what is the public good? But as a general principle, it says that the laws that are, uh, should have to be enacted in good faith for the promotion of the public good and not just to be capricious, arbitrary, and just being an annoyance or oppression of a class. So let's see how they, what is that public good? That's the question that was first posed by Carrington, then seconded by Ashley. He wants to know then, why are you doing it? You agree, separating people by hair color makes no sense. 
So then why are you separating people by race? What, what makes it reasonable and how is the public good promoted? So let's hear from, I don't remember, what was your name? Deborah. Deborah, okay. Uh, let's hear from you, your name? Jeremy. Jeremy? Yeah. Okay. To read on. Yeah. Yes, uh, G. So far, so far then, as a conflict with the 14th Amendment is concerned, the case reduces itself to the question whether the statute of Louisiana is a reasonable regulation. Okay, let's stop. As you could see, that's exactly the point that Carrington made. In order to justify this legislation, you have to demonstrate there's some reasonable cause for enacting this statute. Or as <laughs> Ashley said, why are you doing it? I don't see, what is the benefit? Where is the public good? The court agrees. This statute cannot be enacted unless you can show something positive, some good coming of it, Otherwise, it's just arbitrary and capricious, and it becomes just an annoyance and an encumbrance on people. So go ahead. Where was I? Um, You're up to, is a reasonable regulation. And with respect to this, there must necessarily be a large discretion on the part of the legislature. In determining, the, in determining the question of reasonableness, it is at liberty to act with reference to the established usages, customs, and traditions of the people, and with a view to the promotion of their comfort and the preservation of the public peace and good order. Okay, who can summarize that? What is the public good that the court is asserting the state has the right to promote. Yes? Maintaining social norms? Yes, that there are customs, there are traditions, there are usages, there is a way of life that people have become accustomed to. And the good is for the sake of preserving the public peace and for the sake of preserving good order, we should, in the, 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 the statute is legitimate. It's reasonable because that's how people have grown to live. And we all know that from living in New York that neighborhoods have the right to preserve their ethnic character for good order, for peace, and because different neighborhoods have different customs, different traditions, and uh, different usages. That's perfectly clear, isn't it? Go ahead. Uh, gauged by this standard, we cannot say that a law which authorizes or even requires the separation of the two races in public conveyances is unreasonable or more obnoxious to the 14th Amen Amendment than the acts of Congress requiring separate schools for colored children in the District of Columbia the constitutionality of which does not seem to have been questioned or the corresponding acts of state legislation. So they're saying that if everybody accepts separation of races in schools, then it doesn't seem to make sense to the court that we should now prohibit separation in public conveniences, conveniences in trains. Okay, go ahead. Um, Let's see, this gentleman here, your name? John. John. H. We, can <clears throat> we consider the underlying fallacy of the plaintiff's argument to, uh, to consist in the assumption 
that the enforced separation of the two races stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. Okay, here is the critical argument that most of you made, that separation intrinsically, necessarily, inevitably, inherently stamps one group with inferiority. That's the argument most of you have been making against the legitimacy of this statute. So let's see how does the court respond. Go ahead. If this be so, it is not by, by reason of anything found in the act, but solely because the colored races chooses to put that construction upon it. So what is he saying? He, what is the court saying here? <laughs> yes. Exactly. It's all in your mind. <laughs> it's all in your mind. Go ahead. The argument necessarily assumes that if, as has been more than once the case and, and is not unlikely to be so again, the colored race should become the dominant power in the state legislature and should enact a law in precisely similar terms it would thereby relegate the white, <laughs> white race to an inferior position. We imagine that the white race at least would not acquiesce in this assumption. Acquiesce means agree. This I think is a quite clever argument. Can anybody restate the argument in his or her own words? Uh, Carrington? Um, it's like that Eleanor Roosevelt quote of no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Right. But then they go on and say the foul, <laughs> Marsha? Black people should assume their power and create a law that does the same thing and see if white people will feel the same. And okay. I'm pretty sure that they won't. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they, the court says, hey, a majority of people in Louisiana are African American. It's possible at some point, which they were in the past, he's referring to the Reconstruction period, he says it's possible to have African Americans come into power. The court says it wouldn't surprise us if they pass exactly the same law, like we don't want to sit with white people. <laughs> and then the court says, let's say, hypothetically, they pass that law, which is certainly possible. The court says, we don't think white people would think such a law made us inferior. <laughs> but I don't think that's so obviously wrong. What makes that argument wrong? It's hypocritical. Well, I, I think it's the recognizing the fact that the white race feels superior. No, they're saying... Talking about something that will never happen. Why? I'm talking about something that the percentage of it actually happening is so minute because you already have laws designed that it will not happen. <laughs> I don't know if that's so true. You know, Jews, true. Jews <laughs> lived in a situation in Europe where there were laws that discriminated against them. And then the first thing they do when they found their own state was they create laws <laughs> that discriminate against non-Jews. So it's perfectly possible that it could happen. How y'all doing? Uh. The library's closed in 10 minutes, so I'm just giving y'all a warning. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Ten minutes. If, oh. Can I ask a question? If we don't leave promptly in ten minutes, are you going to open fire? Carrying <laughs> 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 Whenever we have some of the library, we'd love you to always come back. <laughs> don't never just stop today. Come back every time. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to hear. Uh, seriously now, and I know you were being serious, you said it would never happen, but under the law that they're talking about, it could happen. But they make, an, they make a critical argument here. As Marcia said, their argument is, if you feel you're inferior, it's all in your head. And as Carrington said, Eleanor Roosevelt famously said, uh, nobody can make me. F nobody can make me inferior. Uh, give me the quote again. I thought it was 
no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Correct. Nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. So the court is saying <coughs> that if you think this law makes you inferior, it's all in your head. Just get it out of your head. But it contradicts and, I, and I said myself, if I were on the receiving end of that law, I would say, F you, I don't care. Just as long as I have equal this and equal that, I don't care who sits next to me. So what's wrong with the argument here if there's something wrong with it? Um, Your name again? Uh, Ricky. Ricky. So one of the things that I found interesting was that although it does make this argument that if it happened to white people, then they might not have cared, um, it does recognize context earlier. Customs, way of life, and history, basically. Right, well, your argument. So up to a point, the court does recognize that for there to be peace and order, we have to take the subjective elements under consideration, which means that the court, I believe, fully knows that there is a possibility that people will feel inferior and that it's not entirely unjustified. Or will have conflict if they sit Or will have conflict, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's what it seems like they're recognizing. If because it's interesting reasonable. that they don't really define a way of life in customs and traditions. Because it, it, it's basically a, a, a bomb that's ready to explode. If they ever did, this argument fails. I'm listening. Go ahead. Um, one of the problems I see is that um, so in H, you know, they, the the court rules that it's all it's all in your head. But in G, uh, the the quote unquote public good is the established uses, customs, and traditions yeah. of people. I think traditions are all in your head. I think you know that's just made up. Like I don't think you you could argue that that's just an abstraction. And I and I think that that's the biggest contradiction. And I think it goes into the fact that the court recognizes like whether it's traditions or even the definition of what is white or what is black or what is colored are not like that that's why I don't uh, I don't think the uh, the comparison with the bathrooms is legitimate like uh, maybe like you can use because unlike you know not gender but sexes are real N not gen you can you can make the argument that gender isn't but sex is Okay, we can just talk about that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, and I think the custom uses, cus traditions, and the definition of race for the court, those are real. But when it's someone saying, no, it's like, but when they have a grievance, that then that's suddenly it's on your head. So I don't see, like, I don't know. Does but anyone? I, 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 I'm, I'm hearing you out. Yeah. And we have only 10 minutes. I would like to get to the end of this um, decision. Um, the problem I'm having with what you're saying is everybody here in this room recognizes a concept of a way of life. It is real, a <laughs> way of life. That, uh, that's why we recognize what's called the principle of self-determination. What is the principle of self-determination? Nations are different and each nation has the right to form its own independent state. That's why people think Tibetans should have the right to their own state. Kashmiris should have the right to their own independent state. Chechnyans should have the right to their own independent state. We recognize Puerto Rico should have the right to its own independent state because we recognize there is something called a way of life that is actually has some kind of material reality. It's inscribed in 10,000 things from your clothes to your food to your whole way of life. But this notion of inferiority, the court says, is much more subjective. It's the Eleanor Roosevelt approach. I'm only inferior if I believe I am inferior. But Before we continue, I'm going to just ask one person just to read the last so we can continue next week. Uh, who would like to read the last passage? Uh, okay, then let Jesse do it. Just so we completed it, we won't be in the middle. Talking about um, I, I, that passage? Yes. All right. The argument also assumes that social prejudices may be overcome by legislation. 
and that equal rights cannot be secured to the Negro except by an enforced commingling of the two races. We cannot accept this proposition. If the two races are to meet upon terms of social equality, it must be the result of natural affinities, a mutual appreciation of each other's merits, and a volunt voluntary consent of individuals. As the point said, here being, you can't force people legally to like each other. That you want to create a law that forces white people to live with black people or black people to live with white people. They said you can't do that legally. It has to be a natural evolution through mutual natural affinities. A mutual. You have to know if you like a person, <laughs> if you're separated from them. Totally. Right. There is a, that's a very good argument, <laughs> which we should get to next week. But the other part, I think, is also true. Do you really, do you really achieve a mutual respect and understanding by legally forcing people to live with each other? That isn't what the case. The case isn't to force different people races to sit next to them. It's just to allow them. That's a difference. We'll get to that. Bring it up next week. Go ahead. Uh, this end uh, can neither be accomplished nor promoted by laws which, conf which conflict with the general sentiment of the community upon which they are designed to operate. When the government, therefore, has secured to each of its citizens equal rights before the law and equal opportunities for improvements in progress, it has accomplished the end for which it was organized and performed all of the functions respecting social advantages with which it is endowed. Now here's the last par paragraph. Uh, it's important. We'll get to it next week. Ashley, you're getting impatient. This uh, is get... Wait, uh, he, we, we, we're we're oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, the meeting has to be adjourned. <laughs> okay. So ladies and gentlemen. We've got four minutes, actually three minutes before we got library. Yeah, That'll be close to nine o'clock. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll just look at that last paragraph uh, next week and then we'll go to the, move on. Okay. No way, it's adjourned. Oh. I just want to take this off. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be emailed? Yes, um, folks, do me a favor. Folks, if you don't, if you're not yet on the email list, um, email me because. They will be sending you each week the stuff you have to print out at home. So it's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>